Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are tuning in from and listening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our recording and our audio uh, for the upcoming podcast. And I'm delighted this afternoon to have Nicole Gates. Now, she is a very unusual person. She has an enormous story to tell, but in addition, it's the story that led her to where she is today. So I'm not going to cloud any issues. I'm going to allow her to tell her story so you hear it from the horse's mouth. So, Nicole, welcome and thank you for being our guest today. Oh, pleasure, Maggie. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Why don't we start at the very beginning where it all started? Okay. So I was 16 years old when I had a life-changing motorcycle accident. Uh, I was in New Zealand at the time. I was born in Australia but raised in New Zealand. And as crazy as it is, you could get your licence at 15 over there back then. Can you believe it? 15-year-olds driving. Anyway, <laughs> I got my first tax return at 15 and it wasn't enough to buy a car but it was enough to buy a motorbike. And I was a pretty independent young lady. So I bought myself that motorbike, despite my mother's absolute disgust. <laughs> so this particular night, I was planning to go and see my friends play basketball in the city. And it was a cold, dismal winter's night in New Zealand. And uh, mum didn't want me to take the motorcycle out. And we argued before I left. And I stomped my feet and said, I'm 16 and I'll do what I want. <laughs> stomped out the door and got on my motorcycle, put my helmet on. And I was approaching on the way there, I was approaching a roundabout and my, the lights on my motorcycle just went out for no reason. And there was a bridge to the left of the roundabout and I couldn't stop right there. Otherwise, I'd be stopping in the middle of the roundabout. So my plan was to get to the other side of the roundabout, pull over, figure out what was wrong with my lights and keep going. I never got to the other side of the roundabout. I was collected by a car who kept going. It was hit and run. I got entangled in my, bump, my bicycle, my motorcycle. My motorcycle got entangled on his bump bar and he dragged my young body over that cold, hard concrete for about 200 metres and then continued going, sparks flying off my motorcycle, petrol permeating the air. He dragged it for another about 1,000 metres before my bike disentangled from his bumper bar and took his licence plate with it. So I was left for dead in the middle of the road. Now a fellow travelling by, thought I was a jacket in the middle of the road and pulled over to pick up the jacket and found me. I was very, very lucky that he happened to be a nurse at the local spinal hospital and my arms were spasticised up to my chest like this so he knew it was either severe brain injury or spinal injury or both and did all the right things. You know, I died on the road. That was my first near-death experience and he resuscitated me on the road. Was then taken to hospital and they did CAT scan to figure out what damage had been done. I died again under the CAT scan and that was my most vivid near-death experience. Mum was there. She was already at the hospital when I arrived. The police had come, gone to get her and a nurse knelt down in front of Mum, took her hands and said, Veronica, you can expect death or life in a vegetative state for Nicole. And she looked at the nurse and she said, you don't know my daughter. You don't know how strong she is. And she began to pray. And that strength of mum's never wavered. Even I remained, in, I lapsed into a natural coma. I was put on life support. And I stayed asleep for three weeks. But during that three weeks, Mum massaged me, she talked to me, friends and family were stimulating me as much as they could. And eventually I slowly awoke from that coma, but I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't see to begin with. 
I couldn't control any of my bodily functions and it looked like they might have been right, at least in part. But still she didn't give up. She continued to work with me, manipulate my limbs, you know, she and friends and family would come in and do the same. Um, and I eventually could use one hand and so she brought in a notepad because I couldn't talk. So she brought in a notepad because I was obviously trying to communicate, but I just couldn't get the words out. So I, I wrote, and one of my first communications was, where is my puppy? Because when I was in the coma, she tried to bribe me out of the coma with the promise of a puppy if I woke up. <laughs> I did eventually get that puppy. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was another couple of years of intense rehab, psychological therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, hydrotherapy, phys physiotherapy. My goodness, we even tried crystal healing. Nothing was out of bounds to try and get me as good as I could possibly be. But the doctors, even though I walked out of the hospital, the doctors still had a very negative outlook for my future. I've got a report which says if Nicole ever returns to any type of employment, it will need to be highly supervised and won't be meaningful work. Sounds a lot like a sheltered workshop, doesn't it? Sure does. Um, when I finished school, they put me on a disability pension because that's what they thought my future looked like but it wasn't the future I wanted. Mm. So, Nicole, what change that made you decide this is what I'm going to do? There was a couple of things. Before the accident, I actually wanted to be a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the you won't, you can't, you'll never kind of mentality that the black and white medical model espouses based on anatomy and physiology, um, didn't really support that sort of future. Uh, so it wasn't until I was about 27 that I started to sort of contemplate. I'd had some some wins along the way. You know, I was, I was a beauty therapist at the time. I was managing salons. Um, and I sort of thought, well, yeah, maybe I could. Maybe I could go to uni. So I procrastinated on that for another couple of years. And um, and basically in my early 30s, I went to uni and did rehabilitation counselling. And that was the beginning of my pathway of basically helping people to overcome odds, to, you know, crack barriers and return to work after injury. So I had quite a good success in that area, but it took another few years, on 15 maybe, uh, to write the book. <laughs> and Holding On To Hope was sort of born out of my book. And then it was uh, you know, helping people with brain injury to reach their highest potential, to overcome barriers, to re yeah, basically ultimately to re reach their highest potential no matter what the medical professionals say. I just love that because I dare medical professionals to put a ceiling on where you're going to be and how you're going to recover because yes. that's just, it's just putting a, a ceiling where there no need to be a ceiling. The sky's the limit. Yes. Well, absolutely. Look, it took, it took about 100 years for the concept of neuroplasticity to go from a concept back in 1868 with a man called Jules Coutard who was working with children with left hemisphere brain injury and frontal lobe brain injury who had aspasia and difficulty speaking. And it was only back then that they sort of realised that oh, some of these children had that brain damage but didn't have the speech issues. So maybe one area of the brain, when it's damaged, other areas can take over. Another 100 years before it starts actually being used in treatment for people with brain injury. And even 35 years ago, when I had my brain injury, there was still a cap of you know, you need to get as good as you're going to get within two years because oh. that's it. That's all the brain healing you're going to get the next two years. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the brain never stops healing. It depends on the exactly. input. 
So can I just um, ask you a very simple question? Why should young people be worried about things like Alzheimer's disease? Because that's so prevalent and in an area where you are active. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we know now that there's a gene for Alzheimer's disease, the APO4 gene. However, we also know through epigenetics, which is becoming more and more um, studied and, you know, researched and so forth, that just because you have a gene does not mean that it's an absolute that you're going to get that disease. And it's environmental triggers that actually trigger that gene to erupt. So whether and whether you have that gene or not, you can reduce your risks of Alzheimer's disease with lifestyle choices. You know, Alzheimer's disease can take years, sometimes decades before, you know, the symptoms of memory loss actually come to the surface. So there can be 10, 20 years before that, that the Alzheimer's disease has started and the brain atrophy and the, the buildup of beta amyloid plaques and all that sort of thing. There are things we can do every day, such as uh, not eating so much sugar, for example, which causes brain shrinkage. Um, so please expand on that because I don't think a lot of people realise that. Yeah, well, look, the brain consumes so much of the oxygen in our body. It's our most demanding organ when it comes to burning calories. So about 80% of the calories that we ingest are actually utilised by the brain. It's a very hungry organ. So what we put into our body is literally, you know, you put crap in, you're going to get crap out when it comes to the brain, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, sugar is something which there's actually radiological evidence now that it does shrink the brain. And I met a lady through a business networking group a few months ago and she had a brain tumour and needed surgery on this brain tumour. But the tumour was in a position that was very difficult for the surgeons to access. So she told me that they gave her a really a full-on sugar solution just before the surgery to shrink the brain so that they could access the tumour more readily. <laughs> That's how significant sugar oh is gosh. on the brain. So, yes, if you are concerned or even if you're not concerned now because you're young and think you're invincible, this is the reality. And so, so tell me, Nicole, what is your sort of plan of action to help people who've experienced and had a brain injury in their recovery? What is your yeah. plan of action? Yeah, look, initially, Margie, what I do is a really thorough initial assessment. There's a lot of questionnaires to fill out and so forth. And what the aim of that is, is to identify what areas of the brain are working well and which ones are struggling, what areas need some improvement and some help. And then I design a specific brain health program specifically for that person with exercises and activities to strengthen those areas of the brain that are struggling. And yeah, so that's the so whole would, concept. Would this also include people who've had a stroke? Absolutely. I'm working with a couple of ladies at the moment who have had strokes. And it's also about memory management, whether it's a brain injury as a result of stroke or accident or oxygen deprivation or drugs or alcohol. The memory suffers. And I teach people memory strategies. I've got a memory management app as well that I've designed specifically to help people with that memory management to, uh, you know, whether it be for goal setting, for management of appointments, tasks. It's got brain training games on it as well, um, memory training games. It's got health information, brain health information, articles in it that they can read. And probably the most unique part of this app is that you can also invite your friends, family or support workers into the app by just sending them an invitation. And then if you need that person to take you to a medical appointment or assist you with a task, you can invite them into that appointment or task and it shows up in both of your calendars and it auto-populates with Google as well. So basically, and it's a point-based system, so you earn points with everything you do in the app. When you put in a, a task or appointment into the app, you get a point. When you tick it off as something that's been done, you get another point. When you read articles, you get points. When you play brain training games, you get points. And you can build, there's 10 levels that you can build up to. 
inside the app. That sounds absolutely fantastic. So I know we've got below the details how people can contact you, but is there something that you would like to offer people who've heard this interview and who are interested to hear more? Is there something for them? Absolutely. Look, that app is absolutely free. It's available on Apple or Google Play. I've actually got a little um, flyer here with the QR codes to easily download it. Um, so yeah, basically, if people want to get this, I can forward this to you to, to pop up there, Margie, if you like, or people Fantastic. can contact me directly, or awesome. um, or just go straight onto the App Store or Google Play and look for Rethink without an H. So it's R E T I I N K. I like that. I like yeah. that. So yeah. So Uh, that is really awesome. So we now, we have your website, we have your Facebook, we've got your Instagram, and we've got LinkedIn. So there's all kinds of ways that people can uh, contact you. So just in closing, do you have, say, your top three tips for brain health? Yes, well, number one, eliminate as much sugar from your diet as you possibly can. Um, Get your vitamin D because vitamin D is partly responsible for the production of leptin, a hormone which tells the hypothalamus in your brain to stop eating. So if you're not getting enough vitamin D and that hypothalamus is not sort of giving you your hunger messages to stop eating, then you're probably going to be wanting to eat more, eat too much and put on weight. Uh, And omega-3. Omega-3 is an amazing product for the brain, for the immune system, for the heart, for the body. But, um, you know, for me, it's all about the brain. (laughs) Well, and Nicole, I must just tell you, I so enjoyed hearing your story again and sharing the most amazing work that you're doing. And I've got a good few people I'm going to forward that app to. It sounds absolutely amazing. And it's a free app for anyone who's listening to this broadcast or who watches the recording. Thank you so much for being our guest today. You're welcome. And if you want to read more about my story, it's in my book, Holding On To Hope, available on Amazon and Audible. So, yeah. Fantastic. Holding On To Hope. What a beautiful title. And that really sums up your journey, doesn't it? Absolutely. And that's why I called my company Holding On To Hope as well, because I really was. Hope was the only thing I had to hold on to in so many points. It's a very true message for myself too. Oh, Nicole, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. And to all our listeners, thank you.